Welcome to Asian American Life. I'm your host, Ernabel DeMillo. So the Lower East Side has always drawn immigrants from Asia, Europe, and the Caribbean. During the 19th and 20th centuries, many of the families settled in these tenement buildings, turning this neighborhood into one of the most diverse in America. We'll hear more about their stories coming up, and you'll get to meet our newest team member, Rainer Ramirez. But first, here's a look at what's ahead. Kyung Yoon reports on the men behind the headline news. Mike Gilliam looks at the silent epidemic of alcohol abuse. Plus the art of soji, Rainer Ramirez on the Japanese sculpting woodwork tradition. And I'm cracking up with Asian pop as I go behind the scenes with an all Asian American female comedy group. This and more on Asian American Life. Hundreds of immigrant families lived along this tenement row. Now their history and stories are being told at the Tenement Museum. I'm Minnie Rowe. If you've ever wanted to travel through time, well, now's your chance. At the Tenement Museum in New York's Lower East Side, there's a new exhibit that allows you to experience what life was like for new immigrants living in New York City right after World War II. The story of New York can be told in many ways, through its streets and boulevards, its unique skyline, the welcoming harbor. But most importantly, it is told through the stories of its people, including generations of new immigrants. The Tenement Museum on Orchard Street on New York City's Lower East Side is dedicated to these new Americans and the lives they lived. In replicated apartments like this one, the life and times of these new New Yorkers are on public display. Kat Lloyd is the museum's director of programs. We started in the 1950s with the Epstein's apartment, um, and we explore the, the lives of Coleman and Rivka Epstein, who lived in the building from 1956 to 1961. The Epsteins, Holocaust survivors from Poland, provided a distinctly American way of life for their children here in the New World. Others would follow, among them Romanita Saez Valez and her family. Uh, they were a family um, from Puerto Rico who moved into this building, 103 Orchard Street, in 1964. So we are currently in 1964, and Romanita, she lived in the building for almost 50 years. Wow. And when she moved out, her sons donated a lot of her belongings to the museum. So some of the things we see in this space actually belonged to Ramanita. And many of the other things are inspired by memories of the family, of what Ramanita's home was like. We know Ramanita always covered her couches in a plastic uh, cover to make sure that nothing happened to them when she had parties, when she was entertaining, when she had family over. And we also tell the story of the Wongs, a family of Chinese immigrants who moved to the neighborhood in the 1960s. Mrs. Wong and her family were part of the ever-expanding Chinese population that transformed the Lower East Side in the mid-20th century. Daughter Allison Wong remembers growing up in a cramped but comfortable apartment. The bedroom that I stay in, I shared with my older sister and younger sister. My older sister and I would have the bunk bed and then right across, maybe like two or three feet, would be my younger sister. So we had one closet, one desk, we had to share. But we was near the fire escape, so I guess we can go out whenever we want to. The fire escape was nice. <laughs> Allison's mom, like thousands of other working class Chinese women, worked in New York's garment district. My mom worked for nine hours, and she had a good one hour lunch break. And it's very laborious, hardworking, because you're dealing with a lot of needles and scissors, a lot of cutting of threads, uh, a lot of fabric. If I know, like, her fingerprints got worn out. New York was the epicenter of the garment trade, and Mrs. Wong assembled some of the more fashionable styles of the day. The museum has recreated a sewing center, similar to the ones that once dotted downtown. And on this day, mother and daughter took a walk through some shared family history. Nothing, my brother loved these comics. Oh, okay. All right. Mrs. Wong worked long and hard, focused, steadfast, sending her kids to college and to a better life. Well, I'm very thankful that we have the opportunity to come, come and live in New York City. I mean, New York City is a very unique, wonderful, welcoming city, especially in the Lower East Side. We have a very large uh, Chinese population. It's near Chinatown. So I'm very thankful for the people that came before us to make that opportunity open to us, uh, the Chinese immigrant family.
Like the millions who came before them and those who have arrived since, these immigrants say they are proud to call New York and America their home. I'm Minnie Rowe for Asian American Life. I'm Kyung Yoon. Asian Americans are the fastest growing ethnic group in America, and that's news to some people. But if you click through American TV channels, you won't see many Asian Americans reporting the news. And chances are the ones you do see are women, not men. We take a look at the lack of representation of Asian American men in broadcast news. It was cold out here last night. And Safan Kim is a reporter for WABC TV in New York City. Born and raised in Philadelphia, he remembers his childhood as one fist fight after another with kids in the neighborhood who bullied him because of his race. I think that as a child, I understood that this fight wasn't just won and lost in a playground, right? Like this was a bigger issue, a societal issue. And when I thought about it, even as a young child, um, I recognize that media oftentimes influence the discussion, the landscape, the, the way communities are treated, and there was, an, there was an absence, there was there was a void, right? There was nobody who looked like me. This made Kim determined to fill the gap and pursue a career in broadcast journalism, ultimately landing a coveted reporting spot on New York City's ABC affiliate, where he's a fixture on the local nightly news. You're watching Bloomberg Best, I'm Rainy Innocencio. It has been another busy... Rainy Innocencio is an anchor and reporter for Bloomberg Television, based in New York and broadcast internationally. Born in San Diego and raised in the Washington, D.C. area, his journey to the anchor desk came by way of Asia, where he spent more than 15 years working in television and radio. When I walked the streets when I lived in Hong Kong, uh, you know, you blend in with the crowd. Here, you blend out with the crowd. According to the Radio Television Digital News Association, which tracks working professional broadcasters by gender and race, both Safan Kim and Remy Innocencio are a rarity. Asian American men are the most underrepresented group on television. Journalism professor Angie Chung says historical and structural biases are partly to blame. Really the early um, ideas of yellow peril and the idea that Asian American men were uh, not trustworthy. And then you get into the wars with Asia and the idea of the enemy alien, uh, Japanese American internment, and there's a very long uh, troubled history of particularly men being viewed as potential combatants or spies and the idea of somebody being trustworthy, authoritative, all these qualities we look for in a news anchor or reporter not being associated with Asian American men. But some news managers insist that the lack of representation of Asian American men on TV is because there just aren't enough of them applying for the jobs. Kim says if that's the case, there are cultural factors and self-selection at play. Very few Asian American men grow up thinking that this is a viable career option, that, that it's something that's important to, to pursue. Um, for cultural reasons, we don't necessarily have parents and families and backgrounds that necessarily encourage this type of um, career, this line of work. Here at Bloomberg, when people asked me what I was doing, I said, oh, wait a minute, I'm the only Asian American guy on broadcast. And I thought that was really, really cool. Uh, Bloomberg has been a huge supporter of diversity and inclusion, but also looking ahead, uh, I would love to have there be more folks here, uh, Asian American males, because we're not just speaking to the United States, we're also speaking to the world. Both Kim and Innocencio are active with the Asian American Journalists Association, doing their part to encourage and mentor more Asian American journalists to follow in their footsteps. Innocencio says a turning point for him as a young journalist was when he had a chance to interview the actor George Takei of Star Trek fame, whom he saw as not only a pioneering Asian American on TV, but in his later years, an outspoken advocate for LGBTQ rights. For me, it's a nexus, not just of being Asian, but of being an out LGBT leader. Uh, and so that is very inspiring to me. So I hope that in the future, I can be inspiring to someone else. Whether it's the Me Too movement, whether it's you know um, national politics, whatever it may be, right? I think the solution is that each person has to do their part, right? This is not a struggle that one person 
can overcome and just change, right? It, it takes a community. We need to have a larger discussion about looking at the elephant in the room and asking on the station level, on the industry level, why this disparity exists and what unconscious biases um, hiring managers and others have brought to the table to create this situation and can we actively work to, to overcome this. But the biggest change may come from the digital revolution, which makes news and who's reporting it more accessible to a diverse and global audience that want to see people who look like them. I'm Kyung Yoon for Asian American Life. I'm Mike Gilliam. Alcoholism is a big problem in the Asian American community, but it's rarely spoken of because of the stigma that's attached to it. But there is help available. Caroline Yu was born in upstate New York, but lives in the San Francisco Bay Area of California, where she's a suburban single mother with a professional career and two boys, aged 8 and 15. I didn't really think I had a problem at all. Um, and then got to later in life and realized, you know, I was drinking more and I, I couldn't stop. I had a series of events happen in my life. Um, marriage wasn't working out, had stress of being the primary breadwinner, um, trying to raise two young boys. I ended up turning to drinking as a solution. At first she thought she could control her drinking. She would binge drink, but she still managed to show up for work and do her job. I was a big wine drinker, vodka. In the heat of it, it was probably every day, and I, mean, I could go through two bottles of wine in one night by myself. A lot of that was not social drinking anymore. It was drinking alone and, and really trying to hide it from people. For Caroline, alcohol offered an escape from real-world problems and feelings. But that became a problem in itself, a problem you don't hear about a lot in Asian communities. People don't like to talk about it. They don't like to admit. Vasudev Makija is a psychiatrist in Linden, New Jersey, who's worked extensively on alcoholism in the South Asian community. Asians generally, and South Asians in particular also, they tend to be more private people, and uh, they don't want uh, people to know about their issues. They like to handle their problems themselves. That's one of the reasons Raj asked that we not divulge his true identity. He says he knocked back a pint of Black Label Scotch a day. And just like Caroline, he drank to avoid the stress that came with working long hours in a critical job and dealing with family issues. Due to the stigma of the community we live in, it is so hard to come up that you have a problem with alcoholism. Because if you do admit it, you're considered a low life. Mouthing the words to my family that I have a substance abuse problem had to be one of the most difficult things I have ever struggled with. Caroline says her family rescued her by getting her into a program. She's lucky, but many aren't because the problem isn't being dealt with honestly. One of the problems that we have had is uh, the data collection. They lump everybody together into one group. But there can be sign. What might happen is uh, the person might have serious health issues because of drinking or have some accidents, motor vehicle accidents or a fall uh, or get into trouble with the law, lose a job. Others will have a sort of epiphany, realizing they need help I'd really crossed the line, you know, just gotten really careless and one day just decided that I would start drinking in the morning. I was at a work event and just completely made a fool out of myself. Just felt completely hopeless and helpless, devastated. That's when Caroline reached out to her family. I felt very ashamed and felt that, you know, I would make my family look bad. And I think those are things as Asian Americans we probably think about more so than others. More Asian American men than women have alcohol problems. And according to Dr. Makija, 99.8% of Asians who have a problem do not seek treatment, compared to 92% for the rest of the U.S. population. 
Caroline entered a five-month outpatient program that changed her life, but it was tough early on. For South Asians, Dr. Makija began to work the community, forming the first South Asian AA group. Raj was the first person to join and was at times the only one at meetings that eventually grew to as many as 15 members. Being an alcoholic, there's every little thing that could trigger you to a drink, but your best friend is AA. This provides an alternative where a person who cannot speak English, for example, it provides that cultural backdrop within which they are able to uh, have this meeting. The doctor says one of the real keys for dealing with alcoholism is to understand it's a disease and a mental health issue. It can also lead to depression and anxiety and higher rates of suicide. There is no need to just suffer. You can get the treatment and seek help. Take advantage of all the treatments out there, including attending the AA meetings. There should be no stigma. Don't be afraid to ask for help. I wish I'd asked for help sooner. I was much too proud. I was much too ashamed to admit that I had a problem. If you or someone you know could use some help with alcohol abuse, the South Asian AA meetings take place every Thursday night from 8 to 9 at the First Presbyterian Church in Island. I'm Mike Gilliam for Asian American Life. I'm Rainer Ramirez. Today's world is furnished with mass-produced goods, but there's one company in New York's Chelsea neighborhood that continues to go against the grain. For almost 70 years, Mia Shoji has been creating handmade Japanese shoji screens, furniture, and lamps right here in New York. Hisa Hanafusa is the owner. You look at the table. It's no human statement, more nature statement. Don't have to design. Channeling the shape of nature into Mia Shoji's pieces is a philosophy rooted in the centuries-old tradition of woodworking that can be found in temples throughout China, Korea, and Japan. You figure out, dovetail. One is easy, but two, three, four-sided. Diagonal. Hisao came to New York in 1963 to pursue his passion for painting and found work at the Mia Company using the skills he learned growing up in Japan. And yeah, this is a local cherry wood. This portable table Hisao made 50 years ago is a replica of the one he used as a child in Miyazaki, Japan. So pretty much that's the whole method of how everything we make Mirror image. No nails, no screws. You know why? We cannot afford it to buy a nail. <laughs> Zui Hanafusa joined his father to continue the legacy of the shop, which was founded in New York City as the Mia Flower and Novelty Company by Chasuki Miyahira back in 1937. During World War II, the flower shop employed Japanese Americans who were relocated from the West Coast by the War Relocation Authority. After the war, the company diversified and started making shoji screens using wood native to the East Coast. The real way of actually making stuff is to actually use the actual material that's around the area. And it wasn't just for, you know, some sort of the good of mankind, or it actually was the good for nature. In the 1970s, the Mia company split in two when Mr. Miyahira sold the imported goods business to his nephew, which continues to this day as the Mia company. And Hisao took over the woodworking business under the Mia Shoji name. Zui took us to their workshop to show us some of the tradition ingrained in their craftsmanship. 
you gotta sharpen the tools so you have good cut. It's almost like sashimi. You have sashimi or you have fish bait. So you have to always sharpen your tools. Each piece of wood is hand planed to achieve a finish that's smooth as silk. And the shoji screens are built to reflect how the trees grow. You could see it. So even here, you have you know, top of the tree, you have the bottom. The frames are interwoven to ensure its strength and durability. So in 1955, we created the shoji to be almost like a picture frame. So you could put the paper inside and you could see on both sides because they were going into apartments to separate rooms, lofts. So it's two-sided from Japan to New York City and adapting. Today, Mia Shoji continues to adapt in order to compete in a world accustomed to what Hisao and Zui call a disposable life. When you're just looking at the actual business like a, a ship, you know, is it sinking? Maybe it's sinking, but you know what? You know, we could still make it to land, whether it's my father, the carpenters, and myself. It's something that we look at it like a ship that we could sail across the ocean. Two generations of Japanese-American craftsmen continue to create their art. For Asian American Life, this is Raina Ramirez. So what happens when you mix K-pop and satire? Well, you get Asian pop. Coming up, you'll meet these funny ladies who had me in stitches. Rice, rice, all types of rice. Black, white, Puerto Rican, Chinese rice. Meet the ladies of Asian pop. They are as diverse as, well, rice. They're an all-female Asian-American comedy sketch group, and they are not afraid to school you about rice, K-pop style. Colors and regional variety. Bring it back to the era of the Pearl River Valley. Seed was planted in the ground, harvested in the patty. Anna Suzuki, Ileana Innocencio, Anne-Marie Yu, Maya Deshmukh, and Angel Yao make up the girl band slash comedy group who take the sweetness out of the popular genre known as K-pop and J-pop and add biting satire. The group's bread and butter, or rice and butter, is their live act. They perform in New York and around the country. In fact, they met while working in the New York comedy circuit. We talked to four of the members recently at Stand Up New York in the Upper West Side. I lived in Japan until I was 12, and I grew up listening to a lot of J-pop. Uh, and then once I started doing comedy in New York, I realized uh, no one's combining the two. I knew it was everything I wanted to work on because I was tired of doing like Miss Saigon and King and I stuff like over and over. Everything just like worked with what I wanted to do next. K-pop, known for its pretty boys and girls in matching costumes singing catchy melodic tunes while dancing in perfect sync, is perfect fodder for satire both on stage and on YouTube. In Rice to Meet You, they are dressed in schoolgirl uniforms, teaching two men buying rice that not all rice is created equal. A dig, they say, at how Asians are perceived as all the same. We all have very defined characters. You know, I'm baby rice. I'm She's brown, brown rice. rice. You know, we have edgy rice, competitive rice, and quirky rice. So mm -hmm. already that's breaking down like the idea that all Asian women are the same. Their second video takes on another stereotype. We want to tell you what all Asian girls like. White guys. I would say it's one of our most popular songs. Meanwhile, it was by accident, not design, that the group is Pan-Asian. Anna is half Japanese and Jewish. Ileana is Filipino and Singaporean. Angel is Chinese. And Marie is Korean, and Maya is Indian. And yes, they address that elephant in the room. There is that, like, people don't think of Indians as Asian. And I think there also are. is that, like, inter-Asian struggle. I know yes. a lot of Filipino people yes. feel this way, not to speak for Filipino no, people. No, but we talked about this. Like, the brown yeah. Asian struggle, or yeah. South Asian, there's, you know... East Central Asian people, mm -hmm. like there was a big thing. That there's, there's a, a hierarchy yeah, that's unspoken. Yeah. During the interview, you get a sense of the bond between them all. After all, there are few Asian American women in comedy. 
I think we all want to make a living doing what we love, which is comedy and acting and writing and singing. It's very hard to do that. It's very competitive and we're all trying to do it. Uh, so I think having this group as a support system for each other and for individual goals is, um, yeah, great. But what about their families? Are they just as supportive? For me, I'm very grateful because my parents have always been very supportive. Um, my dad was one of those white guys who would do like variety shows in Japan. So um, my parents have been supportive this whole time. And I don't think my mom necessarily understands the satirical aspect of the show. I think she thinks we're just like a genuine pop group. They know I do this. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know that they quite understand what it is, but they're like, oh, she's doing this weird performing thing. We kind of, it's not our favorite thing that we wish she was doing, but okay, I guess she's an adult. Angel Yao, AKA Quirky Rice, who couldn't join us, told us that her parents had a hard time accepting her comedy pursuits, but eventually came around after watching her last show. Like Anna, my parents were very supportive of me, but I also think it's because they put all the pressure on my older brother. And then like, they were like, oh, whatever. <laughs> like, you know? So they were, they've been very supportive. But my know. parents, they like, love the, the fact that I would perform <laughs> and they would only come to shows if I was the lead. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Oh my but god. They, but they bring all their like Indian friends that have like rose blocked out. Everybody really saw the cute. show if I had like a lead. Yeah. But if I had a small, I also was like, don't bother. Why are you coming? Mm. But um, they would love to, you know, pimp me out to like sing at every <laughs> Indian gathering and like always Aww. wanting me to sing and all this stuff. But when it came to actually choosing it for a career, they were really against it. Um, I'm actually a dentist, that's my day job. Maybe not for long. For Maya and the rest of the gang, they hope comedy will pay the bills, the big bills one day, and I'm betting it will. I'm Ernabelle DeMillo for Asian American Life. Be sure to stop by the Tenement Museum in the Lower East Side. And if you want more information on all our stories, follow us on Facebook at Asian American Life. I'm Ernabelle DeMillo. We'll see you next time.